Energy is what allows us to do anything. It fuels our bodies via the calories we consume. It heats and cools our homes, lights up our cities. It allows us to travel, communicate, manufacture goods, produce food, fight disease, and resist decay. For most of our existence, all of humanity has been at the mercy of predators, starvation, infectious disease, and the harsh elements of nature. The vast majority of us have escaped this thanks to our ability to harness energy. This ability greatly accelerated in the last 200 years thanks to coal and oil and very dense energy sources. Cheap and readily available energy sources means progress, the fast building of cities, abundance of food, freedom from toil, emancipation of women, education of children, light at night, warmth in the winter, travel and communication. But of course, there is a catch. The laws of physics allow us to create order from chaos by using energy, but the byproduct is pollution. So how do we provide energy for a growing population while protecting our air, land and water? Should fossil fuels be eliminated or do they have a role? Are solar and wind the answer or is there another promising energy technology? Efficiency means getting more output for the same input, and as a consequence, reducing the waste and byproducts. We are always striving for higher efficiency as it means needing fewer resources to get the same result. And in the case of energy production, greater efficiency means reduced pollution. But 100% efficiency is not possible, not even in theory. So, how do you manage the byproducts? The easiest way is to not manage them at all. And this was the general approach at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The planet felt large enough for everyone and there were other priorities, such as feeding your family, avoiding death, and achieving prosperity. Clean air and a pristine environment did not seem as important at the time, nor the threat as apparent. Fast forward to today and we have 8 billion people and a per capita requirement of energy hundreds of times higher than in the 19th century the byproducts are no longer negligible. It is important to recognize fundamentally that economic progress means energy consumption. Um, the two are just inextricably linked. And we don't have to look too far back in history at all uh, to see the role that fossil fuels have played and continue to play. Fossil fuels still satisfy 80% of our global energy needs. The most notable byproduct of fossil fuel use is CO2, carbon dioxide. This ends up increasing the layer of CO2 high in the atmosphere, which acts as a greenhouse, eating up the planet in excess of what would naturally occur. Even if we stopped CO2 emissions right now, the pollution layer would remain and the temperature would keep rising. For this reason, we need to decarbonize the way we produce our energy. But that is not enough. We also need to deploy energy to capture the CO2 and reduce the greenhouse effect. All of this while producing more energy for a growing population, more energy to help developed countries escape poverty, and more energy to convert our power generation technology and infrastructure. So let's restate the problem simply. We produce 80% of energy with fossil fuels, but we need to cut down on these while producing even more energy than before and ensuring that no one is left behind. So how do we solve the problem? First, let's distinguish the three main ways in which we use energy. Electricity, transportation and heating. Clearly, electricity is a major component, but everything needs to come into the picture. Deciding what the energy of the future will be is a multi-objective problem. We need to consider not only CO2 emissions, but also environmental impact, renewability, cost, infrastructure, societal impact, scalability, legacy and also longevity. Now, Let's take a closer look at each energy technology. First, fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. Coal is used primarily in electricity production with a share of 40% of global electricity, making it the number one source of electricity in the world. The main advantage of coal is that it is abundant and cheap. Coal was the number one energy source during the first industrial revolution. Throughout the 20th century, it has lifted several countries out of poverty. Because it is so cheap, many developing countries still heavily rely on coal for electricity. In a coal power plant, coal is burned to heat up steam, which drives the turbine, which in turn drives the alternator, 
producing AC current. The main drawback of coal is the pollution. Tons of solid ashes that need to be disposed of together with tons of carbon released into the atmosphere. Out of all the fossil fuels in use, coal emits the most carbon per unit of energy produced. A testament to the fact that humanity is progressing in the right direction is that coal use, despite being still abundant and cheap, has seen a steady decline in developed countries. Next, petroleum, also known as oil. Petroleum derivatives are mainly liquids such as petrol, gasoline, diesel and kerosene, which are all energy dense and portable. And they can all burn cleaner than coal because they produce no ash, making them ideal as energy source for transportation. Natural gas, on the other hand, can be transported via pipelines and burns even cleaner than the liquids with less carbon emitted per unit of energy produced. This makes it ideal for power plants located in densely populated areas, where transporting coal would be difficult and also too polluting. Natural gas is the second largest source of electricity in the world, with a 25% share of the total. In a gas power plant, a gas-air mixture is ignited inside a turbine. The turbine runs the alternator, which generates AC current. The excess heat can also eat up steam and run another turbine, increasing efficiency of the power plant in what is known as a combined power plant. The hot water can also be used for district heating if the power plants are near a city. Because fossil fuels can also be burned directly to generate heat without the need of electricity, they remain one of the cheapest and most efficient ways to provide large-scale heating. Fossil fuels have single-handedly propelled humanity into modernity. Even though we're very far from running out of fossil fuels, their use will steadily decline as alternative forms of renewable energy arise. Now, let's take a look at renewable sources of energy, which are primarily hydro, wind and solar. The most established form of renewable power is hydroelectric. Hydropower accounts for 15% of global electricity production and 60% of total renewable energy produced. Hydropower works by channeling a controlled water flow through a turbine, which drives the alternator. In order to increase the potential energy of the water, usually a dam is built to restrict the water flow of a river, storing more potential energy as the artificial lake rises. This setup can also be used as energy storage. When the electrical grid has excess energy available, the water is pumped back into the lake and used to produce energy later, as needed. Hydropower has great advantages. It is cheap, it is renewable, and emits practically no CO2. The main disadvantage is the environmental impact of the dams, which flood entire valleys and displace wildlife and also alter local ecosystems. Additionally, the scalability is an issue, especially in countries where the geography doesn't allow for this kind of project. Despite these challenges, hydro remains a solid renewable option which will continue to be used for the foreseeable future, even if not as the main source of energy globally. Next, wind energy. Wind as a source of power exploded in the last 20 years, going from almost zero to 5% of global electricity today. This is thanks to substantial government incentives, corporate investments, and advancing technology. As a result, wind turbines are becoming progressively larger and more powerful, reducing the cost of electricity at a breathtaking pace. The progress has been so impressive that now wind is considered one of the cheapest forms of electricity in many developed countries. A wind turbine converts the kinetic energy of the wind into electricity. Given that the wind is free, there are no fuel costs, but there is a very high initial capital investment to build the turbines and the infrastructure required. The turbine blades are massive, up to 60 meters long, making them difficult to transport. Roads often need to be built to access the remote locations where wind is abundant. Another way to maximize the power output is by placing the turbines offshore, where the wind is stronger. Offshore also puts the turbines out of sight and importantly, reduces the impact that these turbines have on land ecosystems. These benefits unfortunately come at a higher installation cost, which pays itself off in the long run thanks to the abundance of offshore wind. And on to the last primary renewable energy source, solar. When we think of solar power, we think mainly of photovoltaic solar cells. This consists of large panels of glass and semiconductor materials 
capable of converting the energy from the sun's radiation directly into electricity. An alternative to photovoltaics is offered by concentration solar power plants, where a series of mirrors concentrate sunlight to one point, heating up steam to high pressure and temperature. The steam expands in a turbine, which then produces electricity. This technology is still marginal with respect to photovoltaics because of the increased initial cost and the lower efficiency. Solar energy use on a large scale began in the 90s and has grown exponentially since, accounting now for 2% of global electricity production. Some countries such as Germany, Italy and Australia now rely on solar for up to 8% of their electricity. The growth of solar, like wind, was driven by the reductions in cost per kilowatt hour of energy produced. This reduced cost was achieved by advancements in manufacturing techniques and improvements in efficiency of the solar cells. Most solar panels are capable of converting 20% of the sun's energy hitting their surface into electricity. Current research is trying to push this efficiency up to almost 40%, near the theoretical limit. This will reduce costs even further while also reducing the amount of surface area required to produce the same amount of energy. The reduced cost of solar energy in developed countries over the last decade has made it a competitive but greener alternative to fossil fuels. So are wind and solar the future of energy production? It does sound like wind and solar promise a perfect solution for a decarbonized future. Other than for manufacturing the components, there are no CO2 emissions associated with the energy production. The wind and the sun are free and always here for us. And with new high voltage direct current technology, power can be transmitted with less energy loss over long distances than on conventional AC power lines. There's really nothing cheaper than the efficiency of making a, a farm, uh, either solar or wind, where you have the resource uh, and being able to build these efficient HVDC lines to take it into locations where you'll actually use it. Like that is going to be your cheapest, uh, most potent way to do uh, renewable energy going forward into new markets than, uh, than really anything else that's out there. But there are a few challenges. The main drawback of wind and solar power is reliability of supply. We cannot control when the wind blows or when the sun shines, and so it is difficult to match the load distribution with the needs of consumption. For this reason, solar and wind currently must be tied to fossil fuels, which offer power when the wind or sun cannot. You may be wondering, why not store the energy from solar and wind to be used at a later time as needed? The challenge here is in how to store this huge amount of energy. The main way to store energy at the moment is by pumping water into large reservoirs. The water is then released as needed to drive power generation, as in hydro. This, however, requires very large reservoirs, which can be costly, unfeasible, or environmentally challenging. Another alternative is offered today by battery storage. Lithium-ion batteries are predominant nowadays, but there are other possible ways of storing energy. These include compressed air, or alternative battery technologies such as molten salt batteries, or even just producing hydrogen via renewable electricity. But which one is best? The way I think about that is to take a technology agnostic approach. We're not picking a winner of a specific chemistry, a specific technology class. We're just looking at where are the economic trends taking us today. In fact, energy storage is something that the electricity system needs regardless of, of renewables, right? It's one of the only uh, mature sort of complex networks that we have in the world that actually doesn't have a form of storage built into it. The electrochemical uh, battery has been around for, for several hundred years, but really it's the 80s and 90s where we've seen lithium ion become this dominant technology, first through consumer electronics and then through electric vehicles, which are driving a lot of this, this demand. Because of that, battery energy storage, um, like if you look at the cell cost in the last 10 years, it's fallen 90% which is a phenomenal decrease. While very promising, it remains the fact that the storage infrastructure needed in order to scale up solar and wind to replace fossil fuels is of monumental size, with the need for vast material inputs. One possible solution to this is to intelligently increase the complexity of the load from wind and solar. Typically, wind produces the most electricity in the middle of the night or during the winter time. Conversely, solar produces most of its electricity during the summer or during the day. The two technologies coming online in scale together can effectively create a very similar looking 
output curve to what we would think of for base load with fossil fuels. All of this sounds great, but there is one further criticism to wind and solar, their environmental impact. First, wind and solar farms require a huge amount of land, which generally occupies and disrupts existing ecosystems. It is estimated that wind farms in the US alone kill between 100,000 and 500,000 birds, of which many are protected species. Additionally, the material inputs required are huge. While there are ways in which turbine blades can be recycled, this still adds to the need to process more waste at the end of the life cycle. Similarly for solar panels, which require the use of several toxic substances and rare earth, which can contaminate the environment and are difficult to dispose of at the end of their relatively short 25-year life cycle. Providing enough solar energy to replace fossil fuels globally would require 40 to 100 times more land, leaving tons of waste to be processed at the end of the life cycle. The final consideration is a reminder that global energy consumption is comprised of electricity, transport and heating. Solar and wind provide electricity and with the development of electric vehicles, eventually we'll be able to also provide transport. Heating is still considerably cheaper when burning fossil fuels, but as the prices of renewable energy go down and heat pumps are adopted more widely, this too can be solved. The answer to whether wind and solar are the final solution for the energy of the future is not as apparent as it seems at first sight. Before we draw any conclusions, let's review another major energy source available to us. Nuclear energy was developed in the 40s for military applications, but its use in civilian energy production currently accounts for 10% of the total. In a nuclear power plant, a nuclear reactor heats up water to a very high pressure steam, which then drives a turbine. In the nuclear reactor, nothing is burned and no CO2 is emitted. Because of the high heat generated, nuclear power plants often use very large cooling towers, where the steam is cooled by evaporation. In order to ensure safety, the nuclear reaction must be kept under control, with coolants and ways to move the solid fuel. Additionally, to ensure containment, a lot of steel and concrete is needed. This generally makes the power plant very safe. In fact, despite casualties at the infamous Chernobyl accident, which was the result of mismanagement, nuclear power is surprisingly one of the safest of all energy sources in terms of deaths per kilowatt hour of energy produced. In order to ensure the safety, however, the construction of a nuclear power plant is a complex and costly process with many regulatory hurdles. This makes the initial cost of a nuclear power plant very high, even if the energy is then produced cheaply. Nuclear fuel such as uranium is very abundant, and because only very little is needed to produce a lot of energy, we can virtually never run out. The incredible energy density of nuclear gives it also another advantage, a low environmental impact. It takes 300 times more land to produce energy with solar than is required from nuclear, and considerably less material input. Cheap, abundant, safe, with no CO2 emissions and a small environmental impact. Then why is a nuclear considered the number one source of energy for a decarbonized future? Scientists have been supporting this form of energy for decades. Public perception plays a big role in shaping public policy, and public perception can be biased. For instance, the term nuclear evokes subconscious negative feelings of association with the war and the bomb, which leads people to overestimate risks and underestimate benefits. Confirmation bias adds to this, as information in favor of the technology is ignored and information against gets inflated. Also, we can easily picture in our imagination an incident like Chernobyl, but we cannot think of the hundreds of thousands of people who die because of air pollution linked to fossil fuels, or the many individual accidents that lead to deaths in the renewable sector, so we think of them as less likely. This is why most people are shocked when they hear that nuclear is one of the safest forms of energy. There is also public concern about the disposal of nuclear waste, which is the spent fuel used in the reactors. Because this waste is radioactive, it is perceived as difficult to contain, and yet it is the most containable waste of any other form of energy. The waste that has been generated from the existing nuclear fleet dating all the way back to the 1950s is in a very safe form. It's all contained in spent fuel casks. 
Um, they are stored safely. And if you were to take all of that waste across the US and put it together, it would only cover the size of a football field about 10 yards deep. Compare this to the tons of CO2 spewed completely uncontained in the atmosphere, the giant ash ponds where coal ashes are dumped, or the tons of material waste such as composite, rare earth and glass to be disposed of and processed at the end of a turbine or solar panel farm. Despite all this, nuclear plants currently in use rely on technology from the 50s and a lot more benefits can come from new technology such as Generation 4 reactors. Generation 4 reactors are reactors that use coolants other than water to cool the fuel and they offer really a lot of benefits going forward. And we at GE are very optimistic about the long-term prospects of generation four reactors. Some of the advantages of generation four reactors include the ability to operate much more flexibly and ramp quicker up and down to operate in unison with renewables. The other benefit of some types of generation four reactors are their ability to consume used fuel, that is fuel waste that has been generated from the existing fleet of reactors. So the ability to take that waste, consume it, use it as an asset to produce electricity. But new reactors also present some challenges. For instance, there is no infrastructure and regulatory framework for these new types of nuclear fuels. So it will take some time before this tech is operational. In the meantime, however, a new promising technology is available and can potentially be deployed within the next decade, small modular reactors. These are smaller and simpler reactors that can be mass produced, reducing initial capital cost, making them transportable to any remote area and also easily installable. Inherent features of the design make meltdowns and other accidents impossible, and they have a proven design as they still use the same type of fuel used in old reactors. Thanks to the high temperature involved, they can be used for cheap district heating in conjunction with electricity production, making energy very efficient, cheap and decarbonized. The BWR X300 SMR is going to be operational in the late 2020s, by 2028. This plant that we've designed can fit on a soccer field and it can generate 300 megawatt electric. The advantages are that the energy density, uh, it takes up very little space. It takes up very little transportation of fuel in terms of infrastructure and cars, driving trucks, driving fuel to the site, because uh, that also generates carbon footprint. Obviously, it uh, has a very low carbon footprint itself, the power, compared to oil and coal. Nuclear energy holds the promise of cheap, abundant, dense, safe and carbon-free energy. This will allow us to tackle challenges such as climate change by powering energy-intensive processes, such as capturing carbon from the atmosphere, or desalinating water for irrigation, or electrifying transportation. So, which is the energy of the future? No single technology can be seen as a one-stop solution for deep decarbonization. We cannot expect fossil fuels to disappear overnight or the transition to happen at the same rate everywhere. Because escaping poverty requires a ton of cheap energy, developing countries should be allowed to use fossil fuels as they evolve. Focusing simultaneously on improving the human condition and protecting the environment as a cost that only developed nations can sustain. This means that developed countries should be the first to decarbonize and they should also help with decarbonization in developing countries. I think you can solve a lot with money. Um, this really is um, when it comes to the trade-offs and the choices that developing countries have to make, the best thing that wealthy countries can do is subsidize. Um, make the, the calculus more favorable to alternative energy sources in as many situations as possible. Um, for developing countries, that means they need help in, in making that more attractive financially. Um, and wealthy countries can provide that help. Our goal for poor countries today is 100 kilowatt hours. Um, those of us in wealthy countries are consuming 13,000. So, you know, that degree of disparity, even in our goals, suggests that we really have to be careful 
uh, about not imposing the climate agenda on the countries that are least prepared uh, to pay for it. Uh, you know, we, we have the legacy of creating most of this problem in wealthy countries, um, and we should be bearing the cost of, of, of dealing with it. We have seen that wind and solar are gaining prominence as an alternative to fossil fuels, but that is not enough. If we are to preserve our environment and produce energy in the most efficient way, nuclear energy, especially in its new forms, needs to be embraced as part of the deep decarbonization of our future. Nuclear is also part of the necessary process of densification by producing more energy on less land and sparing more natural habitats. Humanity has come a long way in its pursuit of progress and now we face new global challenges. We have the tools and the ingenuity to face these challenges, but we must let go of unproductive ideologies and embrace reason in order to guarantee a prosperous future to everyone and to our planet alike. If you'd like to learn more about any of these issues, check out the link below or visit rationalmind.show for more information and resources. 